So hi, everybody. We're just going to uh, wait a minute or two. We have people coming in from, uh, from seminars from ANTS, I understand. So we'll wait a minute or two and before we get started. All right, so it's uh, it gives me great pleasure to to welcome you to the depending on your viewpoint Monday or Tuesday edition of our number three web seminar. Um, wherever you're coming in from, I hope you you enjoy this. We are recording this, so again, you can check back in the website. Uh, hopefully, it won't be as fuzzy as the last one, but hopefully, we'll have a good recording up there uh, by sometime tomorrow. If you need to miss this or want to go back. Um, so as, as is usual, uh, we request if you uh, can keep your, your, your audio muted uh, throughout the talk. If you want to ask questions, please fire away in the chat or raise your hand and hopefully uh, uh, either I, I or Alina or, uh, or Philip will, uh, will get that question. We can, we can ask sound. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to, uh, to introduce uh, Sound Rajan coming to us from the Bay Area, Stanford, who will speak on Equidistribution from the Chinese Remainder Theorem, joint work with uh, Emmanuel Kowalski. Fire away sound. Thanks very much, Mike. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. So I want to discuss some work that uh, Emmanuel and I were doing uh, while I was on sabbatical uh, this past year in, uh, in Zurich. And uh, it relates to uh, a very elementary problem where we are going to look at residues uh, that you pick for prime numbers, and then you find residues modulo composite numbers using the Chinese remainder theorem. And we want to study whether these residue classes get equidistributed modulo a typical composite number. Let me first begin by saying the problem that one would really like to study, which is the problem for prime moduli. So there is only one theorem, but it's a beautiful theorem due to Duke Friedland and Ivaniets in this context. If you look at a, a quadratic congruence, like n squared plus 1 is 0 mod p, then if p is 3 mod 4, there are no solutions to this quadratic congruence. And if p is 1 mod 4, there are two roots to the quadratic congruence. You could look at the two roots that you have, form the fractions nu over p, where nu squared is minus 1 mod p, and then study these fractions as you vary over all the primes p up to x. So there's about uh, pi of x such numbers because, so x over log x such uh, fractions, because for every prime that's one mod four, you get two such fractions. And the beautiful theorem of Duke Friedland and Ivaniet, one of the great theorems from the, from the 90s, shows that this set is equidistributed modulo one. So if you pick any interval inside zero one, you, it gets its fair share of fractions landing inside that interval. And uh, this theorem applies to the roots of any irreducible quadratic polynomial, so in the definite case, it's due to Duke Friedland and Riemanniot, and in the indefinite case, it's due to Toth. And uh, that's basically all that we know about roots of polynomials to prime moduli. We would very much like to have such a result for, say, cubic uh, congruences, but this is uh, entirely open. Now, that's a relatively new result. And there's a much older result of Hooley, which considers the roots of a polynomial modulo Q, but now Q is no longer prime, but Q is some composite modulus. So the modulus Q will typically have a lot of prime factors. And then you might, if it has a prime factor for which there is no solution, then of course you're out of luck. You don't get any uh, residue classes mod Q that satisfy it. But you could imagine that if the modulus Q is divisible by all the primes for which uh, the congruence mod p has a solution, then maybe you get a lot of solutions mod q, and you can imagine that these solutions get equidistributed. So what Hooley does is that he looks at any irreducible polynomial of degree d at least 2. He solves the congruence f of nu is 0 mod q. 
he puts all the fractions nu over q as you vary over all the moduli q going up to x and over all the roots for every single modulus q. And then he shows that this set is equidistributed modular one. So this set uh, might typically have, uh, say, x times some power of log x numbers inside it. And uh, the key thing that makes this argument work, which is what I would like to abstra abstract today, is that the roots modulo q arise from the roots modulo prime powers, and then combining the roots modulo different prime powers using the Chinese ruling here. Okay, so. In some ways, what I want to tell you is that this result is really about the Chinese remainder theorem rather than about roots of a polynomial. So that's the, the problem that I want to consider. Suppose for every prime power, I give you a set of residue classes modulo p to the v. So this is a, the set a p to the v. And uh, I'm going to define the cardinality of this set by this new, by, by rho of p to the v. And it could be that for some prime powers, I give you no residue classes at all. So the set could be empty on certain prime powers, and then this function rho of p to the v would also just be zero. And then I use the Chinese remainder theorem to construct a set aq of residue classes mod q. So for every prime power that divides q, I take an element from this, uh, from this given set. And then I form the residue classes mod Q by taking one such element for each one of the prime powers dividing Q. So I get some number of residue classes modulo Q. And the number of residue classes that I have modulo Q would be a multiplicative function of Q. So the size of this would be rho Q. And rho Q is just the product of the rho at the prime powers dividing Q. The question is, what can we say about the distribution of these fractions A over Q as A ranges over the elements in this set? Okay. Now, in order to be able to say anything, maybe I should actually give you some residue classes modulo P for enough primes P. If I give you no residue classes modulo P for every prime P, then of course I give you no residue classes modulo Q and there's nothing to prove. So I'm gonna focus on the set uh, Q, which is all the moduli Q for which I'm giving you at least one residue class modulo Q. And I want to be assured that I have at least a reasonable supply of such moduli. And one way to, uh, to, to ensure that is to say that the primes on which I give you at least one residue class they kind of have positive density. So for every x, there's at least some density alpha of the primes up to x, for which I give you at least one residue class modulo, modulo p. So if I make this assumption, then this guarantees that the set of moduli for which I have at least one residue class is basically what you would expect from the set. Okay, so this would be like uh, the product of one minus one over p, over all the primes p, not in the set where I give you at least one residue class. Okay, so you're always going to start out with some set which has at least like x over log x times some power of log x, some log x to the alpha uh, elements in it, at least as a lower bound. What else can go wrong? Suppose I give you for every prime p, I only give you one residue class modulo p. Then for every residue class mod Q, I also give you only one residue class mod Q, and I may not be able to get any kind of equidistribution. For example, suppose I only give you the residue class one mod P for every prime P, then for every composite number, I'm giving you the residue class one mod Q, and there's no equidistribution theorem that I can prove. So I should at least have that for some substantial proportion of primes, I give you more than one residue class. So maybe I give you two residue class for some large number of primes. And what I want to show is that if I give you at least two residue classes for lots of primes, I want to prove some kind of equidistribution theorem. So let me set up that equidistribution theorem. So for every 
modulus Q for which I'm giving you at least one restricted class. I'm going to associate a probability measure, which is just looking at these fractions A over Q and putting a delta mass at each one of these A over Qs and then normalizing it by the total number of uh, points that I have in that set. If I want to understand whether these points are close to equidistribution, I can consider the discrepancy, which is to take the worst interval in R mod Z, for which the difference between the actual number of points that lie inside that interval minus the length of that interval is as large as possible. So this is the worst interval for which I have either the uh, greatest deviation from equidistribution, either I get too many points or I get too few points inside that interval. And a measure of, uh, of equidistribution would be to show that this discrepancy is small. And I would like to show that this discrepancy is small for many moduli or almost all moduli in my set uh, Q of X. And as I've already said, I can only hope to get a result of this type if I am ensured of a, of a plentiful supply of primes P on which I'm giving you at least two residue classes. This is necessary in order to be able to prove such a theorem. And the main theorem says that this is actually, in fact, sufficient to prove such a theorem. So let's assume that I have a positive density of primes on which I give you at least one residue class. And then suppose I tell you that I have uh, a large number of primes on which I give you at least two residue class. In a very weak sense, I only need to know that the sum of the reciprocals of the primes on which I give you at least two residue classes that sum of reciprocals is something large. So this P, let's think of as going to infinity. If that's true, then for a typical modulus Q on which I have at least one residue class being given, for a typical modulus, the discrepancy goes to zero. It goes to, goes to zero exponentially in this in e to the minus P, in, in this quantity P. Is the statement of the theorem more or less clear. So what it says is that with a small number of exceptions, the discrepancy is small. The discrepancy tends to zero in this, in this parameter capital P for all but uh, the size of the, of the set of moduli times something that's exponentially small again in P. And this is basically the best possible result that you can, you can hope to get because I can say that if, you, if, you, if all you know about the set of primes P on which I give you at least two residue classes is this, actually the probability of not being divisible by any prime in this set is like E to the minus P. So there will be a set about this big on which the size of, uh, on which I'm only going to give you one residue class modular every modulus in this uh, set. So apart from this one sixth, I can't hope to improve this result. If there's only one modulus or Q, one uh, residue class modulo Q, the discrepancy will just be one because there's only one point that you're given. I can take an interval basically of length one, not containing that point, and you will have a big deviation from equidistribution. One point doesn't get equidistributed. Okay, so, so apart from this constant one sixth, this result is the best that you could hope to get. Now, this is a generalization of Hooley's result because in Hooley's case, what I'm giving you is uh, the roots of a polynomial modulo P for every prime P and then building up the roots modulo Q by the Chinese remainder theorem. And then by the Chebotaro density theorem, I can guarantee that there's a positive density of primes on which if I give you an irreducible polynomial, it'll have D roots for an irreducible polynomial on a positive density of prime. And so therefore you can just use the theorem that I described before and get equidistribution for almost all moduli like Q. But there's a small deviation in how we've formulated this problem and how Hooley formulates the problem. So we consider for every modulus Q, uh, the point masses A over Q, and then we normalize that measure by dividing by the total number of points. So each one of these things that we sum 
is a probability measure. And then we average those probability measures over a typical modulus Q having at least one point that we are given. What Hooley does is something slightly different. He takes all the roots of a polynomial modulo Q, and then he takes all the possible Q for which you have certain roots, puts them all together, and then divides by the total number of points. Okay, so these are two slightly different problems that you could formulate on equidistribution. And uh, very funnily, the general theorem that I stated holds in this measure, uh, but not in the Hooley measure. So, so kind of paradoxically, you can construct counterexamples to Hooley's version uh, in the general setup by in fact considering very big sets. For every prime P, I could give you a huge number of residue classes modulo P. I could give you something like P over log P residue classes modulo P. But the problem with giving you so many residue classes modulo P is that if I construct what happens using the Chinese remainder theorem, if you put all the residue classes together and then try to look for equidistribution, in fact, the primes kind of dominate. The primes contribute a positive proportion of all the residue classes that you would put in uh, to all composite moduli as well. So in Hooley's measure, you don't get equidistribution because on the primes, I can just choose the first P over log P numbers and they are not going to be equidistributed. They're all going to concentrate near zero. On the other hand, in the way in which I have formulated it, uh, on the which Emmanuel and I have formulated it, you do get uh, the equidistribution in the setting because every number contributes only uh, one probability measure. It only contributes one, and therefore the primes will still be a small proportion of all the numbers that you have up to that. Okay, so this is the one initial result that we had uh, developing Hooley's idea. And I want to show you a couple of ways in which we generalized it. One is to generalize the problem to higher dimensions, equidistribution in R mod Z to the N for higher dimensions N. And then also to equidistribution in which we restrict the, num the moduli, not to primes, but to kind of almost primes, numbers with a given number of prime factors. It turns out that under reasonably uh, general uh, assumptions, you can even prove an equidistribution on numbers with just two prime factors, although there's no hope of proving an equidistribution theorem for numbers with just one prime factor, right? Because on the primes, I can just choose my set arbitrarily and I can choose it to be just the first uh, 100 numbers, 100 moduli, modulo P, and there'll be no such equidistribution. So let me try to say how to think about this generalization for higher dimensions. So the situation is, uh, is, is like what we had before. For every prime power, I give you uh, an n-tuple of residue classes. So it's a res residue classes in uh, z mod p to the v z to the n. And then I construct residue classes mod q by using the Chinese remainder theorem. OK, I notice a question on, uh, on chat, whether I need some kind of compatibility for different powers of a fixed prime. Actually, the prime powers are not relevant at all. So you, it, the whole thing depends only on what you do modulo primes. If you look at the statement of the theorem, uh, the assumption was only that for a, for a substantial number of primes, I should give you two residue classes modulo P. I need no assumptions on prime powers at all. So if you like, you can say, you can focus only on square free numbers if you like, and the theorem would be true for just square free numbers. You can choose anything you want on the prime powers. It doesn't matter. Any other questions before I discuss what happens for prime power for higher dimensions? Okay. So in n dimensions, I'm assuming that we are given some set of uh, of moduli of n tuples of moduli mod p to the v, which are extended to uh, n tuples modulo q using the Chinese remainder theorem in each coordinate. Uh, for every modulus Q. And the notation is the same as before. Q is a set of moduli on which I give you at least one residue class. And I should assume that there's a plentiful supply of prime moduli, a positive density of primes, on which I give you at least one residue class uh, 
one n-tuple of residue classes modulo p u. And then I'm interested in the equidistribution of, uh, of these moduli a q over, uh, over all these n-tuples that I'm given. And once again, this equidistribution is going to be quantified using a, a discrepancy. So here we use the box discrepancy. So you take a box in n dimensions, which is basically a box in Rn projected down to R mod z to the n. And then you pick the worst possible box in which there's the biggest deviation from the expected number. The expected number should just be the volume of the box. Now, of course, for you know, many moduli, I must give you at least two residue classes. Otherwise, once again, I will not be giving you enough residue classes modulo Q in order to formulate any kind of equidistribution. But here, there's one more obstruction that you could have. Suppose for every prime P, I give you some set of residue classes points in AP, and these points concentrate in a hyperplane. Suppose, for example, they concentrate on the hyperplane that when you add all the coordinates, you get something like one modulo p. I put one to indicate that this hyperplane is an affine hyperplane, not a, not a projective hyperplane, okay? But if they land inside this hyperplane, then when I use the Chinese remainder theorem, all the moduli modulo q are also going to land inside this hyperplane, and I'm not going to get equidistribution inside a general box in R mod z to the n. So, this in the one dimensional case, a hyperplane is just a point. And then I'm just saying that if, if my sets modulo p just concentrate on one point, then I don't get equidistribution and I need them to, to have at least two points in the one dimensional case. So the best thing that you could hope for in the n dimensional case is that you should look for sets that if I give you any affine hyperplane, they should escape that affine hyperplane. Um, there should be enough points lying outside it, and then I should hope to get some kind of equidistribution. And that's basically the theorem that we prove. So I'm going to define this parameter lambda of p. So rho of p is the total number of points that I give you in z mod pz to the n. And lambda of p is going to be the number of points that land inside any given hyperplane. So this is an an affine hyperplane, which is uh, non-degenerate, so these parameters are not all zero, which of course would be boring, but any non-degenerate hyperplane, take the worst case situation of the maximum number of points lying inside. So in dimension one, this quantity would just be one, an affine hyperplane would just be one point, and the criterion that we would need is that the number of points that I give you uh, it's always going to be more than the maximum number of points in a hyperplane. And sometimes I would want this inequality to be strict. I want things to be strictly larger in order to get some kind of equidistribution. In n dimensions, any n points can be put inside some hyperplane. So basically we should think of as having at least n plus one generic points in n dimensions in order to be able to get some kind of equidistribution. So in dimension one, this would be getting at least two points and that's enough. And in dimension n, roughly I want to think of having at least n plus one points, but these n plus one points should be generic and not land in some type of way. And in fact, that's the theorem that we can prove that if you look at the average size of the discrepancy, it goes to zero in terms of some quantity, which I've written down here, what is this quantity? Uh, imagine that the number, total number of points that I'm given modulo p is, let's say, some two times as large as the maximum number of points that land inside any given hyperplane. Then this will be some quantity that's bounded away from, from zero. And then I would like to know that that happens for a large number of primes p in the sense that the sum of the reciprocals of those primes is something tending to infinity, something that's large. So if this quantity is large, then I get equidistribution uh, for a typical modulus Q that I'm considering, okay? To go back to the, the, the 
one dimensional case. In the one dimensional case, this lambda of p is just one. And so if rho of p is at least two, then this quantity is at least a half. Um, this is exactly the same result that I stated before, where this constant, if you recall, was a one sixth times the sum of the reciprocals of the primes, on which I give you at least two recipe classes. So basically, in higher dimension, the necessary condition for equidistribution is also sufficient. If I escape any given hyperplane, then I will get equidistribution on almost all composite models. Okay. Now there are some other variants that we can give of this problem. Uh, we can restrict the number of prime factors uh, of your modulus Q and just uh, ask if you can get equidistribution on numbers with exactly K prime factors. So under very mild conditions, you can kind of guarantee that in wide ranges of K. So one result is that if you can guarantee that this sum that I had, this quantity that I had before is a, a positive proportion of the sum that you have, sum of the reciprocals of the primes, so namely positive proportion times log log x, then I can get equidistribution so long as the number of primes, so long as the number of primes is large enough, so long as k times this density delta goes off to infinity, you get some bound on the discrepancy that goes to zero. So this is pretty mild condition. If you think of delta as being a fixed number, then all it says is that so long as the number of prime factors goes off to infinity, as soon as that happens, no matter how slowly, then almost all such moduli have equidistribution. Okay. Now this very much uses the fact that if you have a number with a small number of prime factors, then typically what that number would look like is that it will have k minus one prime factors that are very small and one prime factor that's very large. And um, that's, so these are not the numbers that you get out of the sieve. I'm looking for pk numbers out of the sieve, but these are just honestly numbers with k prime factors. And if you make a slightly stronger assumption that if you assume that this lambda of p is substantially smaller than rho of p uh, for basically every prime, let's say, uh, let's just say for every prime that this ratio is small, then you can actually guarantee that you get equidistribution even starting with numbers with two prime factors. So to give a special case of that in the one dimensional situation, which is the Hooley result that we started out with, if I gave you something very, very mild, like for every prime P, I give you log, 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 log P uh, residue classes, and then construct something using the Chinese remainder theorem, then as soon as you have a typical number with two prime factors, the residue classes that you construct out of the Chinese remainder theorem will get equidistribution. Okay. So that's a very mild uh, hypothesis. So let me give you some applications of this theorem, and then I will give you a quick sketch of where the, how the proof goes. So the most interesting applications are when the Chinese remainder theorem somehow is in the background that I give you an object which is just defined globally and I don't tell you what the Chinese remainder theorem is doing at the start. So roots of polynomials are a good example for that because I can think of roots of a polynomials modulo Q and I don't have to tell you that I'm constructing them using the Chinese remainder theorem. So a generalization of Hooley setup would be I give you an irreducible polynomial of degree D and instead of just looking at the roots of the polynomial uh, in one dimension, I can look at the simultaneous equidistribution of A, A squared, all the way up to A to the D minus one in D minus one dimensional space. If I give you any hyperplane, and if I ask you how many points on this curve land inside a hyperplane, well, that's a curve of degree D minus one. So you can only have D minus one points lying inside a hyperplane. So that this is your lambda of P in this case, it's gonna be bounded by D minus one. But I know that there's a positive proportion of primes on which I get uh, D solutions to the congruence modulo P by the Chevitara of density theorem. So therefore the theorem applies in this case, the number of residue classes uh, that I'm given is a bit more than the number that can land inside any affine hyperplane. And so therefore I get equidistribution of these uh, in this D minus one dimensional space 
for almost all modular lighting. So in the case of uh, prime moduli, this was a recent conjecture of Khrushchevsky. Apparently this comes up naturally in, in logic, and I have no idea how this comes up in logic. Uh, and he conjectured this uh, for prime moduli. And there's no case in which this is known because as I told you, the only thing we know about primes is uh, quadratic uh, polynomials. And for quadratic polynomials, D is two and D minus one is one. So the duke friedlander Rivandi's theorem is all that you can hope for to get. The next result would be cubic moduli and we don't know even the equidistribution of A modulo P, let alone the joint equidistribution of A and A squared modulo P in that case. But more or less for free, you get the result for composite moduli. You can play various other games with roots of polynomials. You can restrict the moduli to have prime factors in some given subsets. You can, for example, restrict the moduli to the, the primes to be quadratic residues for some, uh, uh, you can restrict the roots to be quadratic residues modulo P. You can restrict the primes dividing this to, uh, to lie in certain progressions if you like. Any number of variants of that type. Another result which was proved in the special case of roots modulo, modulo Q is a recent result of Treason and uh, Pollock. They looked at the smallest solution to the roots, uh, smallest root to f of a is zero mod, mod Q and showed that you can save a log Q to some power for many moduli, many, many moduli Q. And you get that again for free from the equidistribution theorem because you know that the discrepancy is pretty small so if you take a, a, an interval very close to zero, you can show that there will be enough points lying inside that interval close to zero. One more application was mentioned to us by Roger Heath Brown. He noted that you could take an irreducible form fxy in degree at least two, and you, look, you could look at the roots of this uh, xy, mod, uh, roots of this modulo q and prove the equidistribution of that. It follows directly from the theorem that I stated. And this result he thinks will have applications to uh, counting points on certain varieties. Uh, that there, are, there is one case of maybe uh, forms of degree four where this could be used to actually counting the number of solutions to such, uh, such form. You could take some strange examples like you could take two curves and then take the points of intersection of the two curves in two dimensions and then look for the equidistribution of that. So again, what you would need to know is that the intersection of these two curves has enough points uh, to escape any given hyperplane. And that can be guaranteed by typical applications of Bezu's theorem. There is a very weird example, but uh, it's kind of fun. So let me mention that. This is, uh, uh, really strange stuff. These are called pseudo polynomials. A polynomial has the interesting property that if you take a polynomial with integer coefficients, then if you reduce the polynomial, if you reduce the variable mod p, then you reduce the polynomial mod p. So in other words, the values of the polynomial are periodic with period p. A pseudo polynomial satisfies the same property. So it is some function from the natural numbers to the integers with the property that a minus b divides f of a minus f of b for all numbers a and b, okay? So f of n depends only on what n is modulo q for any modulus q. It turns out that there are uncountably many pseudo polynomials. So in particular, there are lots of pseudo polynomials that are not polynomials. And there are some very bizarre examples of pseudo polynomials. So, the floor of E times N factorial has the strange property that it's a pseudo polynomial. Closely related to this is basically the floor of one over E times N factorial, which is basically the number of derangements in SN up to some sign. So both Hall and Ruja gave a characterization of what are pseudo polynomials, you can write down a fairly explicit con uh, condition in terms of some kind of Taylor approximation. You write your pseudo polynomial as 
one plus some constant times n choose one, plus some constant times n choose two, plus a constant times n choose three, and so on. The series will actually converge because if n is bigger than however many terms you go to, the binomial coefficient will be zero from some point onwards. And then if you prescribe some condition on what these constants are for n choose one, n choose two, et cetera, you can guarantee that the condition of being a pseudo polynomial will be satisfied. So you can ask a really strange question as to whether there's an analog of Hooley's theorem, whether there are roots of pseudo polynomials modulo Q that get equidistributed to. It turns out this is actually not true in general because uh, pseudo polynomials are just crazy objects. Uh, I gave a version of this talk before, and one of my students, Vivian Cooperberg, noted afterwards that you can construct pseudo polynomials that are only divisible by primes p in as sparse a set of primes as you like. And so there's no hope of understanding anything about roots of a pseudo polynomial modulo q. But if you take any nice example of pseudo polynomials, like this E n factorial or derangements, it looks like if you look at the roots of the modulo p, there's a plentiful supply of roots of the modulo p. And if you can guarantee that, then it would apply and give you another example of uh, where our theorem holds. And one funny situation where it holds, uh, where we can prove it holds, is the situation where you look at uh, permutations in SN that have exactly one fixed point. These are basically a small cousin of the derangements. We can't prove the same thing for derangements, but for permutations with one fixed point, we can show that these are zero modulo P. They have at least two roots modulo P for every prime P. And therefore, if you pick a general composite number Q, you can say something about the moduli N for which F3 of M is a multiple of Q. Okay, so that's a strange application of this theorem. Uh, but purely for amusement. So let me say very quickly how the proofs of this go. The proof ideas go back uh, to Hooley. To prove equidistribution, I should look at uh, the associated vial sums. So I give you a set AQ, and I'm going to look at uh, the vial sum associated to some given uh, M tuple H is just going to be uh, the natural thing, average over all the points inside AQ with uh, the exponential of H dot product of X. Now, these vial sums satisfy a twisted multiplicativity relation, which is what the Chinese remainder theorem buys you. So if you factor a number, a modulus Q as Q1 times Q2, and Q1 and Q2 are coprime, then the vial sum modulo Q1, Q2 factors as the vial sum of Q2 times the vial sum of Q1, but it's not exactly multiplicative, it's twisted multiplicative. The parameter on which I evaluate the vial sum gets multiplied by the inverse of Q1 modulo Q2 and the inverse of Q2 modulo Q1. Okay, so here's where the Chinese remainder theorem comes in. The Chinese remainder theorem is simply the statement that the fraction one over Q1, Q2 is the same as Q1 bar, uh, over Q2 plus Q2 bar over Q1 modulo one. If I multiply, if I cross multiply and evaluate this fraction, I get Q2, Q2 bar plus Q1, Q1 bar, which is just one modulo Q1, Q2, as in the Chinese remainder theorem. So how does the twisted multiplicativity help us? So here's a very quick description of the proof. Uh, let's factor a, a modulus Q, a typical modulus Q, into its rough part and its smooth part. I'm not going to tell you what the parameter Z is. Imagine that it's some small number, uh, like X to the some power epsilon, maybe like X to the one over log log X or something like that. So S is going to be the Z smooth part, and R is going to be the Z rough part. Then if I want to understand the average of the vial sums over all my moduli, uh, by the twisted multiplicativity, it amounts to understanding uh, this factorized vial sum, H times R bar modulo S and H times S bar modulo R. For the rough part, the rough part basically doesn't have too many prime factors. 
if you like, think of the rough part as just being a prime number. The rough part, I can't say anything, but this is a normalized while sum, so it's less than one at any rate. So I'm going to just put a trivial estimate for this rough while sum and take it out as being bounded by one. Now the smooth part, I'm going to look at a number where all its prime factors are less than z. So the smooth part is something that's going to have a lot of prime factors. And so I'm, going, I'm hoping that on the smooth part, for each modulus, maybe I get some cancellation in a while sum. And therefore, when I put all these cancellations together, because I have lots of prime factors, it's something building up and contributing to the while sums being substantially less than one on average. So how do I make that precise? Well, there is nothing we can extract on the rough part of this while sum, but we can say something about this R bar. If I factor this, if I, uh, if I, if I range over all the moduli R in certain progressions modulo S, pretend that S is say smaller than X to the one third or something like that, the smooth part will usually be reasonably small. So then I can use the sieve to say that in every progression modulo S, I can't count exactly how many rough numbers that exist in this progression, but the sieve will always give me an upper bound of the right order of magnitude. So if I plug in this upper bound, I would be able to say that I can fiber this into progressions modulo S, and each progression gets basically its fair share. And so this R bar modulo S is basically getting equidistributed. So instead of having just one while sum modulo S, I get to play with an average over all the while sums modulo S averaged over uh, this m tuple of values of h all multiplied by some average residue class a. So this is where we are winning because I, even though I may not know anything about these individual wild sums, I only have to understand what they are doing on average. And I can try to understand that by using Cauchy-Schwarz. Use Cauchy-Schwarz, I have to understand the, the L2 norm of these wild sums on average over S. What is the L2 norm? If I expand it out, I get two, two variables, x, x1 and x2, ranging over the moduli that I give you in S. And then what is the average over A giving me? I would want H times x1 to be the same as H times x2 modulo S. So the dot product of this n tuple H with x1 should be the same as the dot product of H with x2 modulo S. If I fix x1, and if I think of what this is saying in x2, if I fix x1, then the choices that I have for x2 are all the choices x2 that land inside an affine hyperplane. The dot product of h with x2 must be whatever the dot product of h with x1 was. And this is where the condition that we imposed comes in. We impose the condition that the maximum of this guy over any affine hyperplane was this quantity that we defined to be lambda of s. So a priori, this sum was bounded by one, but now I can extract a tiny bit more information. For x1, the number of choices is the total number of residue classes that I give you mod s, which is rho of s. But for x2, if I fix x1, for x2, the number of choices that I give you for x2 is just this new parameter lambda of s. And so on the average of the while sums in the L2 norm, I have saved this quantity lambda of s over rho of s, which a priori is less than or equal to one, but I can hope that if s has more and more prime factors, then I save a tiny bit on every prime factor, and so I can build up the savings that I get for a typical modulus. Okay, um, that's basically a sketch of the proof of the main theorems that I, that I stated before. So I have a few more minutes and I'm going to end by giving you uh, one last application of this uh, circle of ideas, uh, which is to averages of exponential sums. And this is one of the ideas that was, uh, that originally motivated Hooley. Hooley noticed that, uh, that the idea that, we, that he had on this equidistribution of roots of a polynomial modulo Q gave you also 
some small cancellation in uh, uh, the example that he gave was to size of Klusterman sums modular composite module like Q. Now for Klus sums of Klusterman sums modular Q, you have a connection with automorphic forms as well. So you can say a lot more in that context. But what Huli did was that he saved a small power of log X. You can do that in general. Uh, and sometimes that kind of input has even qualitative application. In the context of vile sums, this was also developed further by uh, Fouvry and Michel uh, in a paper about 15 years back. So the kind of quantity that you can consider is you can fix a polynomial f of degree d in uh, with integer coefficients, and then consider the vile sum uh, w a q. I've normalized this vile sum by dividing by root q, so that on the prime numbers. Uh, a typical such vile sum would be bounded by d minus one if d is the degree of the polynomial f. For quadratic polynomials, you get a Gauss sum and you can never get anything better than one. But for cubic ones, you get a bound of uh, two. But you might expect that the, the vile sums satisfy some other kind of distribution, some kind of Sauter-Tate or some other kind of distribution in general. Now, Fouvry and uh, Michel, uh, considered averages of this normalized vile sums uh, over all moduli Q. And they noted that for certain classes of polynomials, you can actually save uh, something over the trivial bound that you would get by the way bound. So this theorem kind of uh, adds a little bit to, to that literature. And the main thing is uh, over what Fouvry and Michel did is that you can actually give a pretty simple criterion for when you can prove a result like uh, the L2 norm of these vile sums. You're fixing A and only varying the composite modulus Q. The L2 norm is bounded by X times some power of log log X. So the trivial bound would have been X times some power of log X. And we are basically saying that that power of log X goes away. You might expect that this result is kind of best possible maybe the answer here is actually that this is bigger than bigger than X for a typical polynomial F. This can be guaranteed so long as the polynomial F is indecomposable. And indecomposable simply means that F is not the composition of two polynomials G and H of both of degree bigger than one. Okay, so in particular, if you take any polynomial of prime degree, then, and if you look at the vile sum that's formed by it, then on average over all moduli Q, you can, you can bound the mean square of those vile sums by just X times some power of log one. Okay. Uh, so the difference between this and what uh, Fouvry and Michel did is that they used the work of cats, which uh, is basically something that's going to guarantee that for these, these kinds of vile sums for the prime moduli, as you vary the A, you can try to bound the L1 norm in A of such, uh, of such vile sums. But Katz's theorem is quite, which is some monodromy calculation showing that these vile sums get equidistributed in some group. But to guarantee that equidistribution is quite hard in general, you would need to assume something about the roots of the, of the derivative of the polynomial F and try to show that those don't satisfy certain relations. So the, co the condition in Fouvry and Michel is a little bit complicated. And you can now replace that condition by, by a much more easily easy to check condition. For example, for prime, for prime degree, there's no condition at all. And we also don't need Katz's work uh, in, this, uh, in this proof. And the key input is, uh, is an idea of, uh, that goes back to Fernando Shaw, at least I learned it from him when he was a student of mine, uh, on, uh, uh, on uh, polynomials in two variables over the, over the, over the rationals, plus uh, a theorem of Mike Fried, which I've stated here, which I find quite beautiful and I didn't know about it until fairly recently. This is a conjecture of uh, Schur that goes back to Schur. Take a polynomial f, and you look at the polynomial in two variables, f of x minus f of y, which is obviously going to be divisible by x minus y. So you factor out x minus y. Then that ratio is absolutely irreducible 
it's irreducible as a polynomial over the complex numbers in x and y, unless f is decomposable or f is basically uh, a, a power x to the d or it's basically a Chebyshev polynomial. And basically means that you compose a power with a linear polynomial or you compose a Chebyshev polynomial with a linear polynomial. So like a x to the d plus b would be an example of uh, what this basically means. So this, uh, this is a very uh, beautiful theorem, I think. Um, this theorem actually gives you, along with Hooley's idea of how to think about these uh, uh, vile sums to composite moduli, this gives you the result on, uh, on, on vile sums that I've given here. Well, that's all I wanted to say, so thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>